been unleashed. unleashed 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 hello everyone and welcome back to the horizon advisors unleashed podcast this is andrew Hendricks back again on this fine friday morning happy friday joined by my partner ryan cuss what's going on ryan hey good morning good morning I got you in early today it feels good yeah it's uh Early rise. What do they say about the bird and the worm? I don't know if I believe in that fully. Oh, I do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I stay late. The owl, there's something about an owl too, right? I mean, the owl's a successful animal. It's wise, very it's wise. Very wise and elite at hunting during the night, which is also valuable. That's why we have a great team. We have birds and worms and owls and everything else. But... Yes, it's been an uh, it's been an early morning, which is great um, to get up and get working and uh, have another great podcast. It's going to be a fun weekend. It's going to be a good Friday. Um, we're excited for what we have for all of you today. It's a a little bit of a unique kind of new style of the podcast um, that we're doing today, and it's it's a very timely topic and it's a very important subject, I think, because it does kind of a you know combine all of I guess a lot of the topics that we talk about on this podcast, it kind of combines them all together into something that is, I think, extremely relevant right now. Um, you know, so what we're going to do is, you know, first and foremost, what we're doing is it's going to be a two-part podcast. So we're going to be speaking about a presentation, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, we're going to cover half of it in this first podcast because it's a lot of, lot of subject matter that's all important. We're going to cover the first in this podcast, and then we're going to cover the second and the latter part of the presentation in a second podcast, um, which will be exciting. Uh, again, I think that gives us enough time to cover all of the important information um, that's in here. And what this presentation is, uh, which we will provide the presentation to you as well, full presentation, so you can reference this along the way. But I'm just going to give you the title because I think it sums really up everything. And it's, it's specifically talking about the 2024 election that's looming here in November, but it's called People Care About Elections, Markets Don't. Mm. Trending conversations is, is kind of Powerful. the theme. I'm going to say it one more time. People care about elections, markets don't. Okay, and This is a presentation from Invesco, our friends at Invesco. Thank you, Ryan Levitt, who is uh, the global market strategist at Invesco. That's the, uh, the presentation slides that we're referencing. Um, are from our good friends over there. Um, and again, a lot of great subject matter here. So we're going to kind of jump right into it. But again, I'm going to say it one more time so that everybody is very clear on what we're talking about <laughs> today. Because we talk about this all the time. People care about elections. Markets don't. Let's get into it. The first thing is, is these problems aren't new. And before I even get into this slide, I just want to talk about how how often we speak about this subject during election years. It is probably the most common question we get from clients, prospects, friends, family, fellow investors, do-it-yourselfers, whatever it is. It's almost as if it's what drives the market. Every time we talk about it, it's everyone's biggest question. Um, and it's only relevant again in election years. And it's a very emotional thing for a lot of people. And I think that's why it gets brought up a lot. But it's also very easy to relate the two, right? Oh, you know, presidential elections coming up. You know, this is you know, the, what's going to happen with the market. It's a, it's, it's a very easy combination of questions. But the funny thing is, is that they, it doesn't really have a lot of data that correlates why that question would even be combined together. And... Yeah, that's what, what really cut this what this slide really talks about. Again, the problems aren't new. So, you know, what it is is really it, it might seem like we are living in uncertain times or volatile times or a lot's going on, right? Common themes there are things like, oh, the national debt's never been this high. We've never had a country so divided between Democrats and Republicans. Um, you know, wars. Oh, yeah, war. We never had all these, you know, these wars, these global, these geopolitical issues, these things where we never had this before. You'll hear that all the time. 
But in reality, you know, interestingly enough, there are, have been a lot of these problems throughout history, um, even going way back. And that's why, again, these problems aren't new. So I'm just going to give some examples, you know, right off the slide here, uh, some quotes from some very famous historical people in our country. First one, the U.S. Central Bank is one of the most deadly hostilities existing against the principles of our Constitution. That was Thomas Jefferson. Hmm. He was pretty old. This is an interesting one. From James Madison. For all you history buffs out there, I want to know if you know who these people are. Because <laughs> I do. I paid attention in history class. Public debt is a public curse, is his quote. They were talking about debt, public debt, national debt, all the way back then. The next one. Inflation is a gradual tax upon them. Ben Franklin. We know him, right? We're feeling that right now. Next one. The distemper in our nation is certainly incurable. George Washington, our first president. George G-E-W. Washington. The distemper in our nation is certainly incurable. So again, you talk about the hostilities between the parties, the divide between the people. This has been a subject forever. And then finally, you know, quote, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. John Adams. Right? So you talk about these quotations. You know, it, you could, and you can find hundreds of these. Hundreds. Not just from presidents or other political figures, but maybe from people, significant figures in history uh, that had you know, whatever it might be. It could be a political um, you know, a rights movement, it could be a political movement, it could be any economic movement, it could be anything. You'll find many, many quotes very similar to this as you go throughout history. And it makes you kind of ask the question, right? What do you think is the most important problem facing the country today? Right? If I gave you, you know, uh, a couple options, right, and you answered, okay, uh, is it economic or is it non-economic? Right? Is it, is it the economy in general? Is it the high cost of living, aka inflation? right, that we've had? Is it the federal budget deficit, right? National debt's never been this high, right? Is that, is that the problem? Or is it non-economic things like the government, poor leadership, unifying the country together, right? Or just democracy in general? It's interesting when you look at all of these subjects and all these topics, and when you really dive and go under the hood and dive deep, it's really, okay, it doesn't really relate to necessarily who's in office. You know, kind of the final point of this slide is, you know, just taking right from here is Americans noted economic concerns like high inflation and the state of the U.S. economy as the most important problems, right? So those questions I just asked, those were the two. But also existential concerns such as government dysfunction and sustainability of the nation's democracy. So I guess the point is that no matter who you ask, you're going to get a different answer. And there's a lot of things going on at any time similar to the market, right? So there's not just one thing. That's the point, I think, is it's not just one thing, including the president, that causes the market to move, that causes the market to be its, its own beast, right? There's so many factors that come into play here, and these problems aren't new. We've dealt with them forever. Very good. So the, n- the next slide that we're taking a look at is uh, titled, Markets Have Performed Well under both parties. So whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, somewhere in the middle, it doesn't really matter. Markets have performed well under both parties. You know, and this this is a great slide. I'll kind of go into one of the charts that's in front of us. Uh, but neither partner uh, ne- neither party can claim superior economic or market performance. I mean, we've seen over history, there's been a lot of presence in, you know, overall, you know, our economy has grown, it's got better. Uh, The stock markets posted positive returns across most administrations. So, you know, what I find, you know, when I'm talking with all of our different clients and stuff around these times, you know, you, you turn on the news, you know, all, or you just turn on the TV in general, you can't get away from all the smear campaigns, you know, Trump, 
Harris right now are the two that are kind of going at it. You know, but I think what this will show, this slide will show, is that it probably doesn't matter who wins, you know, from a market performance standpoint. So with this chart, uh, you can take a look at it. We Again, we're going to post it. You know, what it does is it has, I think, 11, it has 13 different presidents uh, charted across it, you know, ranging from all different periods of time in our country. The bottom axis is talking about annualized real GDP. Um, you know, GDP is, you know, a measurement really of a growing economy. So the higher the percentage of GDP, the more the economy grew. The lower the GDP, the less the economy grew. And then on the other axis is the annualized performance of the uh, stock market. And when we're talking about the stock market for this slide, we're talking about the S&P 500. And what you'll notice pretty quickly, you know, when looking at this chart, is most of them, out of the 13, there was two outliers, J.W. Bush and Nixon. And when you look at all the other names, Trump, Bush, Obama, Eisenhower, Biden, Carter, Ford, Reagan, Clinton, Johnson, Kennedy, when you look at their, you know, at least stock market performance, you know, if you look at that axis, they're all relatively the same. You know, some are a little bit higher than others, you know, but still within within reason, within, you know, if you draw a line down the middle, you know, to me it looks like it'd be around 15% when you're looking at those presents that I just listed. I think the biggest difference on this slide is GDP. You know, some of the presidents had a lot more growth in the economy than others. Uh, and, you know, really what you got to look at, you know, this dates back all the way to 1957, is, you know, a lot of these presidents, you know, whether they did a good job or, or not, you know, anybody could debate that. A lot of it really has to do with, you know, timing of when they're president. You know, you look at, you know, J.W. Bush as an example. He's he's one of probably the worst outliers on this chart. You know, he had low GDP, you know, which means he did not grow the economy very well and had annualized negative returns during his presidency. And I think he ran uh, he ran t uh, had two terms as presidency. You know, but when you look at it, you know, J.W. Bush, you know, he faced a lot of issues. I just took a couple notes. You know, he had the dot-com meltdown. So you remember that recession. You know, Bill Clinton was in office. He he rode all the new, you know, the, the Internet was invented during his presidency. So he kind of rode that all the way up. And then J.W. Bush kind of gets in, in presidency and then, you know, boom. The bubble bursts, big recession, bad timing. He also had to deal with, you know, the terrorist attacks, you know, on World Trade Center. And then, you know, the 2008, 2009 financial meltdown, you know, which was a terrible time. So if you think about, you know, what he had to withstand, you know, we could all debate if he did a good job or not, you know, but that was a lot of things he had to withstand. Whereas if you look at someone like Clinton, maybe he didn't have as many obstacles. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line is Clinton's administration. I mean, he had strong GDP growth and he had strong stock market performance. Uh, so, you know, take a look at this chart and, you know, look, look at a little bit of the history. But I think, again, at the end of the day, the biggest cluster, I mean, if, if we're looking at 13 presidents, you know, there is a couple other outliers like Johnson Kennedy that had, you know, pretty good market performance, but super strong GDP growth. You know, but if you take all those other presidents, you know, and you look at them, I mean, they're all very, very similar at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think to conclude on this slide, I mean, at the end of the day, which is what we talk about all the time, I think the theme here is that regardless of the name and the color, meaning red or blue, Republican or Democrat, whoever the name is, whether you think it's a, a, a monster or a devastation or whatever, it doesn't matter. 
because corporations are going to do their best to try to make money. That is their goal. That's as why a they're business. in business. So they, you know, at the yeah, they, you know, they might want someone in office. They might want someone because they think their, you know, their legislation and their ideas and and philosophies are going to help their business. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't matter who's in, they still have to run their business and still be profitable and bring value to the shareholders. So they're going to maneuver the best way they can and move around, you know, to the best of their ability to make that happen. And that's why I think when you when you really truly understand that, then you ask yourself this question, it it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So let's, you know, on that topic, we'll we'll move over to the next slide, which the title of this slide is the range of market returns across administrations has generally been similar. Mm. And it kind of starts with the range of one-year market returns across administrations since 1961 has been similar. Most administrations experienced one-year returns at or near 40%. It's a pretty high number. And suffered through one-year declines of 15% to 20%, which is also a pretty big number on the decline side. And if you're looking at, at the slide, you know, we'll kind of visually speak about it, but if you want to reference it, you know, essentially what it's showing is those 13 presidents, again, that we're looking at, um, and it, it basically kind of shows their, their maximum upside and then their drawdown that occurred, you know, during their presidency, during their term. And again, it's, it's specifically looking at the S&P as an index. So, you know, the one, the one thing to note here is if you just look at the slide, if you knew, if you knew nothing about any of the data or anything on this slide whatsoever, and you were just looking at the blue lines, you would just look at it and say, well, they don't seem drastically different. They're all relatively the same. That's the first thing you would notice if, again, if you knew nothing about anything we're talking about and you just looked visually at the blue lines, you would look at it and say, well, they're not drastically different. And it's true because the data is there. They're not drastically different, right? And again, it kind of goes back to what we just said is that there's not a huge disparity between the market returns and the market drawdowns uh, between the presidents. Yes, barring a couple of the outliers that Ryan just mentioned, right? We had like George W. Bush who had, you know, a big upside in one of the years that he was there. He, he did clip that 40%, but he also had a huge drawdown of over 40%, which was the financial crisis in 2008. And he dealt with a lot of things in between. So yes, you can look at it and you can see there are, you know, really two, the two outliers we mentioned where there's those big, you know, they had a big year or a big return, and they also had a bad drawdown. But at the end of the day, the average of their best years between all these presidents is 44.1%, maximum one-year return. That's the best average that all the presidents had. So if you took their best year and you looked at it, that's the best average. And you look at the average on the downside, again, the worst year basically on all the presidencies, the average is negative 19.4% return in one year. So you have the best average of 44.1 and the worst of 19, negative 19.4 across all of these different presidents, across all these time frames and all the different problems, you know, situations that were going on during all those different times. Those are the numbers. And that's why, again, you go back to here and you look at it and you say, yes, barring a couple situations, most of these lines look relatively similar, and they're all really within that 40% upside and the negative 20% downside. They're all really in between there. So the, the theme of this, of this slide is really just, again, the, the, the subject of the, of the title. The range of market returns across administrations has generally been similar, and the data is right there to show it. So what do you do with this information? Do you look at it and say, eh, I don't know. Well, you shouldn't because this is going back again across many different parties, many different years, and many different problems. We've always dealt with them. Corporations always, again, focus on doing the best they can to bring value to their shareholders. And there's going to be good years and there are going to be bad years. But at the end of the day, the averages are the average. And it goes back to the mean, and it's right here. There's not a huge difference between who's in office and the market return.
I would say, yeah, rather than focusing on who the president's going to be or who the president is, focus on your financial plan. Make sure you have your investments allocated for what you're trying to accomplish. And based on this data, it seems like it's just going to work out for you. Stay in for the long term, I think, is another way to look at this for sure. This, this slide is, uh, you know, very interesting. You know, we could take the politics out of it completely. I think it's just very interesting, period. Uh, emotion, you know, I think makes people make bad decisions. So if you get emotional about the market going down or who the president is and you're making decisions to take your money in or out of the stock market based on those emotions. You know, we've labored it in past podcasts pretty thoroughly that timing the market is extremely hard. Being in the market seems like it's just the best cure for everything is just being in it, having a good allocation, being diversified according to your plan. The name of this slide is investors would have been better off bipartisan, in quotes, fully invested versus partisan. So this chart is taking a look at, you know, if someone just invested during Democratic administrations versus someone that just invested in Republican administrations. Or to make it more simple, you know, if your candidate or the president is a Democrat, you have your money invested. Then the next president's a Republican, you're pulling your money out and going into cash. Then the next president's a Democrat, then you're putting your money back in and you're kind of skipping, you know, presidencies that maybe you don't agree with politically. Hypothetically, the best performing portfolio during the past 127 years was the bipartisan one that stayed fully invested during both Democratic and Republican administration. A partisan portfolio only invested during a single party rule party underperformed by millions of dollars. So when you take a look at this chart, it just, you know, it's again based off uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It dates back to 1896, and it's looking at the fact that you put a $10,000 investment in in 1896. And then it just basically shows a chart. You know, one is only invested during Republican administrations, only one during Democratic, and then fully invested. And if you take a look, you know, the people that maybe would have just done Democratic or Republican, in the long run, I mean, they're still – pretty similar. Actually, what surprised me, you know, is there is a little bit of differential, you know, the Democratic actually had, you know, I'd say like maybe after 2009, you know, had a had a little more of a gap. But again, that could have been just a timing thing. Who was in a, who was in presidency? How was the economy doing? Uh, but the real staggering thing is looking at the fully invested. So when you look at those portfolios, I mean, I'd have to guess it doesn't really have any numbers there. Just looking at it across the chart, you know, that $10,000 investment maybe grew to like, you know, eight, 900,000, 700,000, something like that if you're trying to time. And then when you look at the gray chart, you know, which is staying invested the whole time, you know, that one looks like it hits around 10 million bucks. You know, and the only difference is timing, trying to time in and out. So I think this chart, you know, again, whether you're looking at it from just strictly who's in office or trying to time the market, it, I mean, I think this proves just being in the market, you know, wins. And I know for a fact right now, as we get closer, you know, to the election and we find out who our next president is, I know for a fact I'm going to receive phone calls, you know, from clients that maybe, you know, aren't happy with who got elected and they're going to want to make portfolio changes. They might even want to go to cash because of, you know, maybe they just dislike the president so much. They think the world's going to go to heck just because of one person. Uh, but in reality, 
you know, again, you got to just kind of keep your blinders on and keep focus on your plan and not so much on who the president is. Final slide of today is really, I think it's more of a question, um, but I'm going to make the statement of the title first. And it's the most important election of our lives, in quotes, hasn't mattered much for markets. And, what I, and why I say it, it means more of a question is when a lot of the question has to do with when people ask is, well, isn't this, this has got to be like the most important election of our lives. Look at, look at who we're dealing with here, right? right? They kind of phrase it more of a question rather than a statement. Um, but it can also be phrased that way. People can also make a statement and say, this is the most important election of our lives, very assertively. How many times have you heard that over your lifetime? Honestly, be honest with yourself. Almost probably every presidential election, you've maybe heard that. But I know for at least in my lifetime, I've heard that at least four or five times over my lifetime. Most important. The most important. Of our lives. Well, how could it be the most important if I've heard it four or five times? Just in my lifetime, right? You know, so it's it's a very common statement, a very common question. But guess what? That most important election of our lives or lifetime hasn't mattered much for the markets. So again, let's just talk about this one, right? You know, this data, obviously Harris being involved in the in the election is newer information. This was really looking at Trump versus Biden, but again, you can kind of look at it the same way, you know, Trump versus Harris now in this situation. But if this is our most important election of our lives, well, it hasn't mattered much. And, you know, for here's the stock the, market. For the stock market. And here's and here's why. So if, again, if you're looking at the slide and you're looking at the chart, you know, it really says market performance through the first eight hundred and twenty seven days of both the Biden and the Trump administrations were remarkably similar. You know, the only big difference in the chart when you're looking really is the COVID situation in 2020, you know, where the market had a very steep decline because of the pandemic. Many people were afraid. Big corporations were moving people from home. Obviously, there was a lot of changes. That was a new, uh, new event in our lifetimes. But look at even that. Even with that happening, which was a completely new, right? We go back to the other slides where these aren't new problems. I mean, that really kind of was like a new problem in a way. We hadn't seen it in a long time. And it still had similarities in terms of the data and the market performance and everything else we spoke about. But, you know, yes, it still happened. So, of course, it is on the chart. You can't take it away. It's a factual piece of data. It is an outlier, but it is still a piece of the data. But even when you look at that, with it still being there, it is still remarkably similar. Yes, the drawdown was a little more steep and quicker because of the COVID situation during Trump's. Biden's was... He had a steep decline, but it was more elongated. But at the end of the day, the charts are still very, very similar. So even though, you know, Trump got election, elected before, then Biden got elected the second time, and now we're back in it again, this most important election of our lives didn't really have that much data to support that it had really a whole lot of difference in the market. Yeah, both presidencies had positive returns mm -hmm. through, their, through their tenure. And this, again, is looking at the S&P 500. I know we looked at the Dow, uh, which is a different index last slide, but this is going back to the S&P. And again, it's just looking at it versus election day in 2016, which was Trump and Hillary Clinton, and 2020 election day, which was Trump and Biden. And now we're coming up in 2024, which will be Trump and Harris. It hasn't mattered much for the markets, even though, again, it's been the most important election of our lives. Mm. It's interesting, again, when you... And this is why I always say... You've probably heard me say it, and I know if you've, if you've been in a meeting with me or a client of mine, you've heard me say when you look under the hood, I, I use that phrase because many people just like to look at the surface level, right? It even goes with the S&P and looking at performance on indexes or certain stocks or other things. People like to just look at the surface level. Oh, this went down because Biden's in office. This went up because Biden's in all. This went down because Trump. This went, you know, they just like to look at the service. And they, they, they very rarely like to look under the hood and see, okay, what actually happened here? What, maybe, maybe is there potential other factors that had to do with this rather than just the surface level of who's in office? Many people don't like to do that because that takes time. 
knowledge, experience, other things, right? Um, and then, you know, ultimately time. But they don't like to do that. They just like to have the easy, the article that's in your face, the red, oh, market's down because of this. But they don't like to look at everything else. And I think that's one of the key themes also of this presentation and of this first piece of the podcast is don't just assume that the surface level factors are what's actually driving the market or driving decision making or driving performance up or down. There's a lot of things that go into it and there's a lot of things still to see and remain to be seen that are going to impact what's going to happen in tw the rest of 24 and 25 and so on. So it's easy to look at the big, the very big question, the most important election of our lives. Mm. It's very easy to say that and look at that as an ex as the excuse, I think, almost, or the answer to problems. It or gets the, people to vote. It does. But it's not always that answer. It's not the answer to the problem. It's not the answer to the positive either. Um, Again, because there's not a whole lot of data to support that. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Again, we have a whole other piece of the presentation to go through that does support a lot of this and has further great information on supporting this theme that we're talking about, which is people care about the election, markets don't. Um, and we have a lot more to cover. But we're going to stop it here for today and conclude on this slide. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for the, uh, for the inside information. And we'll be looking forward to uh, the next part of the presentation. And we will see you all then. Thank you very much. Ryan Cuss, President and Financial Planner. Alexander Dinzer, Managing Director and Financial Planner. Andrew Henricks, Financial Planner. Securities and advisory services offered through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA slash SIPC, a broker dealer and registered investment advisor. Satera is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Tax planning services offered by Horizon Advisors. Tax and accounting services provided by Horizon Advisors CPA. Satera Advisor Networks does not provide tax nor accounting services. For a comprehensive review of your personal situation, always consult with a tax or legal advisor. Neither Satera Advisor Networks LLC nor any of its representatives may give legal or tax advice. The views stated in this podcast are not necessarily the opinion of Satera Advisor Networks LLC and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities. Due to volatility within the markets, opinions are subject to change without notice. Information is based on sources believed to be reliable. However, their accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investors cannot invest directly in indexes. The performance of any index is not indicative of the performance of any investment and does not take into account the effects of inflation and the fees and expenses associated with investing. A diversified portfolio does not assure a profit or protect against loss in a declining market. All investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Distributions from traditional IRAs and employer-sponsored retirement plans are taxed as ordinary income and, if taken prior to reaching age 59 and a half, may be subject to an additional 10% IRS tax penalty. Converting from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA is a taxable event. A Roth IRA offers tax-free withdrawals on taxable contributions. To qualify for the tax-free and penalty-free withdrawal of earnings, a Roth IRA must be in place for at least five tax years, and the distribution must take place after age 59 and a half or due to death, disability, or a first-time home purchase, up to a $10,000 lifetime maximum. Depending on state law, Roth IRA distributions may be subject to state taxes. Investing in mutual funds is subject to risk and loss of principal. There is no assurance or certainty that any investment strategy will be successful in meeting its objectives. Exchange-traded fund and mutual funds are sold by prospectus only. Investors should consider the investment objectives, risks, and charges and expenses of the mutual fund or ETF carefully before investing. The prospectus contains this and other information about the product. Contact Alexander Dinzer at 5455 Corporate Drive Suite 306 Troy, Michigan, 48098 or 248-265-6662 to obtain a prospectus, which should be read carefully before investing or sending money. Horizon Advisors, 
5455 Corporate Drive, Suite 306, Michigan, 48098.